So thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Sanderoff, and I am a traditionally trained pharmacist. I used to own actually two pharmacies in downtown Baltimore at one time, and after being in the stores for about 10 years, I really started to question what I was doing and came to realize that giving people medications for their chronic diseases, which is what we do in Western medicine, is not really helping make those problems go away. And that put me on a path of discovery to figure out how health really works and to help people understand health and functioning from a different perspective. I have been known to say that the number one killer in this country is not heart disease, it's not diabetes, it's not cancer. The number one killer in this country is misinformation. And it is my contention that many of us do not fully understand the ramifications of our decisions, and that is the crux of the work that I do, is helping people understand truly how things work and the ramifications of their decisions. And then, if understanding those ramifications, you choose to change how you do things, that's great, and if not, that's great as well, as long as you understand the ramifications of those decisions. And so an example of that would be if somebody has a gluten sensitivity. I've got a patient who uh, migraine headaches chronically for 20 years. She literally told me that she did not know a day without pain for 20 years. And we got her off of gluten and those headaches went away. If she, after having that experience, decides that having the pizza is more important than her headaches, then at least she understands that when she has that piece of pizza that it's related to those headaches. So what we're talking about today, the topic that we're talking about today, is one of those issues that we do not fully recognize that our decisions are playing a huge role in how our brain works. And again, just to remind everybody for the newcomers that just came in, if you have a question while we're going through this information, please just type right into the question box on your control panel and I will see it right away. Also want to remind everybody that a big part of the work that I do is to act as a resource. And so if you need help in applying the information you hear to you as an individual, or if there's something else that's going on that you want to talk about, you have questions about, please do not hesitate to either call me or email me. All that information is right through the website, wellbeinggps.com. So let's go ahead and get started. So what we're talking about here is cognitive decline. I have a couple questions for you. First of all, is it normal and is it acceptable for our brain function, whether that's focus, concentration, memory, is it normal and acceptable for that to decline as we age? Now, it may be normal in respect to the fact that it happens to a lot of us. So it is commonplace, but it doesn't mean it's acceptable. It's certainly not acceptable to me. And biochemically, it doesn't have to happen either. What do our doctors tell us? Well, our doctors will tell us if you go to them and say, hey, you know, memory's not what it used to be. Doctor's likely going to shrug shoulders and say something like, well, you're not a spring chicken anymore. And that's sort of this subliminal way of saying that it is acceptable it is normal. It is what's supposed to happen as we get older, and it doesn't have to be that way. Well, here's a question. Can new brain cells and nerve cells even be made? Now, it used to be in medical teaching that you were born with what you got, and once you lose a brain cell or a nerve cell, or if you kill one off, that's it. They don't come back. But more recent research is showing that actually we do have the ability to make new brain cells and nerve cells. And some of that is under our control. And, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about today. Here's my favorite quote about this topic. And that is that the optimal brain is the result of a series of personal choices. Now, there are times when I say something like that and people look at me and say, well, you're blaming me for, you know, whatever happening. And I guess in some respect, I am. It's not really about blame, but it is about responsibility. 
And to me, the other side of that coin is that this is a tremendously um, encouraging statement because what it says is that if we are willing to change some of our personal choices, then the result of those choices will change as well. And in the case of what we're talking about today, brain function will get better. So here it is. If I had a drum, I'd be playing a drum roll for you. Here is my six point plan for maintaining optimal function, optimal brain function as we age. So I'm gonna lay them out for you right here and then we're gonna go into each one a little bit more detail. So I'm a little bit more than others. So number one is exercise. Number two is sleep. Number three is what I call challenge your mind. Number four, listen to music. Point number five, you have to maintain hormonal balance. And point number six, is that there are supplements that can be helpful in this entire process. So let's get to it. Let's get to point number one, which is exercise. So the first point to understand is this concept of nerve cell multiplication. During exercise, nerve cells release certain proteins. They're called neurotrophic, neurotrophic factors. Sorry. There's one in particular called BDNF, which stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And that is a trigger for the production and release of numerous other biochemicals that promote nerve cell health and directly benefit cognitive function, including learning. So we are geared to think that when we go out and exercise, it actually helps benefit our muscles, which of course it does. It helps us burn calories, which of course it does, but it actually helps our brain and nerve cells as well. When you exercise, different nerve protective compounds are made. And so it's kind of like that use it or lose it thing. When you use your body, your body is better prepared to last you longer, but not just the physical you, the mental you as well. Exercise causes an increase of communication between cells. It causes increased blood flow to the brain. And this is a really interesting one here, increased numbers of mitochondria. Now, if we go back to the basic you know, uh, cell biology that we probably all learned in high school, we were taught that every cell has a membrane and then inside the cell are these different little organelles. And one of those is called a mitochondria, which basically is the power plant of the cell. So that's where sugar gets converted into, uh, you know, the, the currency of energy within the cell. And that's how we create energy. And when we're showed that model, we are shown one mitochondria. But the truth is, is that cells have multiple mitochondria. And when you exercise, you actually increase the number of mitochondria within the cells. And this is a tremendous advantage for cells throughout your body, including in your brain and nerve cells, to be able to do the work that they're supposed to do. They can make more energy within that cell, which is what fuels the work that they do. So of course, when it comes to brain cells and nerve cells, we're talking about focus, concentration, memory. We're talking about cognitive function. So how about, how about talking about some studies? So there was a study done in 2010 that was done on primates. And in this study, which by the way, was published in Neuroscience, it showed that regular exercise not only improved blood flow to the brain, but also helped monkeys learn new tasks twice as quickly as the non-exercising monkeys. That's really interesting, though that information can be extrapolated to humans as well. And it's one of the reasons why I am such a, an opponent of what's happening in schools these days where physical education is becoming less and less part of the curriculum. It's a huge mistake because that physical activity actually enhances our ability to learn new things. And so we're having a harder and harder time with our kids in schools. We're seeing more and more attention issues and behavior issues. And one of the ways to start to reverse that is actually helping those children get regular exercise. What's the best kind of exercise? Well, it's a couple you know, ideas that I have. Number one is the exercise that you're doing, you have to enjoy. It has to be something that you like, because if not, you're not going to stick with it. So if for you getting on a treadmill and running for 20 or 30 minutes is drudgery, 
don't do it that way because even if you make yourself do it, you're not going to get the same benefit from it and you're probably not going to stick with it. So dancing, swimming, walking with friends, hiking in the woods, whatever it is, make it something that you enjoy. I also would recommend that whatever time you have to dedicate towards exercise, half of it should be aerobic exercise and the other half should be geared towards building muscles. And there are some times when you can combine activities so that what you're doing is actually muscle building and aerobic. And when you're doing your aerobic exercise, you want to do exercise that will increase blood pressure and heart rate within the exercise, ups and downs. So what I'm talking about is interval training. So if you go out and you get on that treadmill and you run at the same pace for a half an hour and your heart rate and your blood pressure go up to a certain place and then stay there for that entire half an hour, that is not as beneficial for you as it would be if you ran as hard as you can on the treadmill for 30 seconds and then slowed it down for you know two minutes and then ran as hard as you can for 30 seconds and then slowed it down. Because what happens is your heart rate and your blood pressure go up and down and up and down within that exercise session and it is much more beneficial for you. It's more beneficial for your cardiovascular health. It's more beneficial for creating growth hormone and burning fat and it's more beneficial for brain function as well. If you go out and you do a Google search for a specific kind of exercise, which is called PEAK8, P-E-A-K-8, that's a really good one to do. You do that three times a week. It takes around 23, 24 minutes to do. That's an amazing way to get your body to start to function better. Okay, point number two has to do with sleep. So want to make sure you realize that when you're sleeping, it's not just physical regeneration that happens. It's mental regeneration and repair as well. Sleep gives you the opportunity to sort of release the quote unquote brain charges that have occurred from the day, that you've accumulated from the day. Here's some research that was done at Harvard. And what it showed is that people are 33% more likely to infer connections among distantly related ideas after sleeping. And very interestingly, few people actually realize that their performance has improved. And I want to talk about the concept that's called plasticity. And basically, this is sort of the growth process that happens when brain cells and nerve cells are stimulated by and potentially changed from events or information from the environment. So it's actually our ability to learn. It's, it's growth and learning that happens from interacting with our environment. So a simple example of that would be when we're young and we see that the stove is on and water is boiling on the stove and we don't know what that means. And we reach our hand up and we get burnt. There's a learning that happens from that where then next time we're put in that situation, we recognize that touching that water will burn us and hopefully we don't do it again. The term for that is actually called plasticity or the, the process that happens. So sleep and sleep loss can modify the expression of various genes that influence synaptic plasticity. It's also suggested that synaptic connections are strengthened when we sleep, allowing for better learning and memory. And research has also shown that infants who sleep in between learning and testing sessions had a better ability to recognize patterns in new information. So what that means is that when we were in nursery school and we spent the morning learning things, that nap that we then took actually helped us integrate that learning. And the same is true in adults. And so this is actually sort of scientific evidence supporting the idea of those power naps where when we get, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to sleep or to nap, it actually recharges us, it regenerates us, and it actually increases our ability to learn and or use what we've learned already. Okay, so that's the sleep thing. And I also tell you that if you have sleep apnea, if you're not sleeping properly, these are huge issues that play a role with our ability to learn and ultimately for 
cognitive function. And so uh, I did a whole webinar about sleep. It's on the web. It's on the archives on our website. Here's one question that you should ask yourself. Do I dream when I sleep? Because if you're not dreaming, you're not getting into the lower, deeper levels of sleep where a lot of regeneration and repair happens. And that is an indication that there's a problem. And so if you're not dreaming, even if you're getting six or seven hours of sleep, you're not getting the same sort of benefit that you would if you were in a deeper sleep. And so that's something to work on. And there's a whole host of supplements and techniques to do for that. All right, let's go on to point number three, which I call challenge your mind. So what are the results of continued learning? We know that our world expands when we're younger and we're going through school. And that's because there's sort of a mandated learning that happens there. And for many of us, after we get out of high school or college, lots of times we stop challenging ourselves and we literally stop learning. So studies have shown that continued learning helps maintain brain function. Not only that, but the size and structure of neurons and the connections between them actually change when you learn. There's all sorts of forms, different forms of learning. There's the traditional book, book learning, <clears throat> excuse me, that, you know, we know about, but actually travel is an amazing way to learn. And it's fun because you don't even necessarily recognize that you're learning. You go to a new place. You've never been there before. You're learning about new cultures and new, new people. You're maybe experiencing new foods or new activities. Uh, learning a musical instrument is a great way to do that or a foreign language. And social participation is also a form of learning and why it is so important as we, um, you know, work with our elder, elderly or if we are elderly ourselves to make sure that they do not become shut-ins because it's that lack of social participation that leads to the mental decline. It just starts that ball rolling down the hill. And so getting out and interacting with people ultimately is a learning experience. There's also this whole area that I call brain aerobics. And <clears throat> here's a whole bunch of different activities. Some of them you know of, like doing crossword puzzles or Sudoku. Um, studies have shown that surfing the web actually is a more active learning experience, especially uh, as compared to sort of passively watching TV. My two favorites on this list are creative lists and using the non-dominant hand. So creative lists, I, I should tell you, I meant to tell you guys in the beginning, this topic is very near and dear to me, and that's because my father actually died of Alzheimer's. And as we know, there's likely a genetic link to that. And so that quote that said about, you know, the functioning brain is a, is a, is a result of a series of personal choices, this, these sorts of activities are ones that are even more important to me because I might have a genetic tendency towards having a bigger problem down the road. And my favorite on that list like I said, we're the creative list and using non-dominant hands. So creative list making. So when I'm driving around, I will play little mental games with myself. I will try to say the an animal that starts with every letter of the alphabet starting with A. So, you know, antelope, buffalo, chihuahua, whatever, all the way down the list. And I try to do it as quickly as I can. And every time I do it, I try to make different animals. Or I will try to think of uh, movies that have numbers in the title of the movie, starting with one and going up as high as I can. Or I'll try to think of songs that have a specific word in it, like love or blue or whatever. So I think you get the idea there. The other one that is my favorite is using your non-dominant hand. And so this is, a, this is a, an exercise in laying down new neural pathways. In essence, exercising your brain and just like your muscle, when you exercise your brain, it gets stronger and it functions better. So if you're right-handed, how about trying to brush your teeth with your left hand or dial the phone? Or how about if you drive the same route to work every day, drive different routes on different days so that you lay down new pathways. You get out of that rut. Anyway, anyways, I hope that makes sense to everybody. I guess I'm doing a good job. I haven't gotten any questions yet. Okay. Point number four, listen to music. Probably everybody has heard of what's known as the Mozart effect. And that's where, 
that's this idea where listening to classical music can actually make you smarter, and studies have shown this to be the case. However, I have to tell you, it doesn't have to be classical music. Um, it can be any kind of music that you enjoy, and I would encourage, again, as a brain exercise, to experience different kinds of music so that you can learn and have that experience. Now, I know this has happened to me, and hopefully it's happened to you as well. Have you ever experienced the phenomenon where maybe you haven't heard a song for a while? Maybe it's a song that, you know, was popular when you were in high school, and now it's 20 or 30 years later, and maybe you haven't heard that song for years, and yet as soon as that song comes on, you can sing every word to it. There is something amazing and some sort of connection that happens between music and information. And so listening to music all the time, you know, when you're driving in the car or in the background when you're at work or when you're exercising. And in fact, while you're exercising, there was a study done on people that have coronary artery disease. And the reason that they looked at these people is because that population, oftentimes, that coronary artery disease is associated with mental decline more than the general public. And the reason is likely because there's lack of blood circulation, lack of blood flow and delivery of oxygen and nutrition to the brain. And what they found is that people with uh, coronary artery disease that listened to music while they were exercising actually boosted cognitive levels and verbal fluency skills. And as it turns out, that effect happens with the general public as well. So it's true among healthy adults. And so especially when you're exercising, if you have some music, you'll actually get more benefit from it. But have the music on all the time. And again, expand your repertoire of what you listen to so that you learn as you're doing that process as well. Point number five is called maintaining hormonal balance, and this is really, really important. So what hormones am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the sex hormones that you're probably familiar with, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. I'm also talking about cortisol, which is the hormone of stress, and the thyroid hormones. You know, it's fairly common to hear complaints of quote-unquote menopause brain when a woman is going through menopause, where they feel like they're in a brain fog, where memory and focus and concentration just aren't what they used to be. And of course, men can experience that same thing. You know, the male version of menopause is called andropause, and that's when testosterone levels start to go down, and the same result can happen. And so balance of your hormones is very, very important. Did you know that there are nerve cells in your brain that actually make these hormones. And because the concentration of these hormones is actually higher in the brain, imbalances can be felt more keenly when there is an imbalance. And I would not be doing my job appropriately if I didn't talk about the role of stress in hormonal balance. This really cannot be ignored at all. So here's what happens. When we're under stress, we make the hormone of stress, which is called cortisol, and that happens in our adrenals. Well, here's something that a lot of people may not recognize, and that is, or realize, and that is that your body actually uses progesterone to make cortisol. This whole story starts in your liver with the production of cholesterol. It's one of the root materials that the body will, you know, uh, change and change until it becomes a hormone. And so some chemical changes happen from cholesterol, and then it becomes what's known as the grandmother hormone, which is called pregnenolone. And then a change or two, and then it becomes DHEA. And then a change or two, and it becomes progesterone. And it is from progesterone that your body will make estrogen and testosterone. The women will make more estrogen, and the men will make higher levels of testosterone. But when you're under stress, and your body is instructing the production of cortisol, which is a different hormone, your body actually uses progesterone to do that. So when you're under stress and you're making cortisol, your progesterone levels can go down. This can be the impetus of a hormonal imbalance. And so dealing with stress is really, really important. 
So that means learning to interact with your environment in a different way, as well as using some of the tools like the different herbs and nutrients that can help mitigate the, express, uh, the expression of stress or the results of stress. Uh, again, I did a whole webinar about stress over a year ago now. It's a really good um, listen, so I would encourage you to get on the archives and, and listen to that one as well. So here is point number six, and this goes under the category of supplements. And there's a whole bunch of supplements that I'm going to talk about. The truth is, is that most of these supplements I could probably spend an hour talking to you about. So this is the Reader's Digest condensed version. These are just the, the, the basic points. And so the first one I call animal-based healthy fats. Now, why do I say animal-based? Well, first of all, these fats I'm talking about are called essential fatty acids. Anytime you see the word essential before a nutrient, it means that your body can't make it. You have to get it from your diet. And that's the case with these healthy fats as well. And they can come from animal sources like fish or krill, or they can come from vegetable sources like flax or walnut. The fats that the body uses are called EPA and DHA. Vegetable sources of these healthy fats, of omega-3s, are not EPA or DHA. They're actually a different fat, which is called ALA. And the body has to convert ALA into the fats that it uses, which are primar primarily EPA and DHA. And many people as they age and many people as their fats are imbalanced in their diet between omega-3s and omega-6s cannot convert ALA into what the body uses. And so that's why we say animal-based. And there are so many studies out there. So I also want to point out the importance of DHA, one of those specific fats. 60% of your brain is fat. It's funny. When I was in elementary school and kids were calling me fathead, they actually were right. So 20%, 25%, a full quarter of that fat in your brain is actually DHA. And that really speaks to the importance of it for brain function. It is the main structural component of brain cells. It also happens to be, DHA now, also happens to be an essential structural component of breast milk, which speaks to its importance in brain and nerve development. And also explains why babies that are breastfed consistently score higher in IQ tests than babies that are formula fed. So let's talk about some studies. And I also want to point out that fish oil has been the subject of really intense scientific study for over 40 years now. It's one of the best, most widely and completely studied nutritional supplements out there. So one study... In particular, they took 485 elderly volunteers suffering from memory deficits. And what they did is they gave them 900 milligrams of DHA every day. And those volunteers saw significant improvements after taking that for six months. Another study, which was more of a placebo-controlled study, they gave 800 milligrams of DHA for four months to a group and placebo to another group. And the group that was getting the um, the DHA showed significant improvement in verbal fluency scores. And those are the two issues that we're really talking about as we age and we're worried about with our brain, memory and focus, and, you know, being able to speak properly. I hear from a lot of people that phenomenon where they say, what I want to say is right on the tip of my tongue, but I can't get it out. That's the verbal fluency part of it. So I want to talk about specific products as well because there's a lot of fish oil supplements out there. Um, you can get them in capsules. You can get them in liquid. All of that doesn't matter. They're all just equally as effective if they're formulated properly. My favorite product to use for this is called Homega by a company called New Chapter. And the reason why – and I don't own stock in New Chapter or anything like that. But I think they're an excellent company. Their fish oil, Homega, is made – exclusively from the waste products of the salmon industry that already exists. And although fish oil, fish, you know, do not volunteer up their oil for us to use, 
these fish are already dead. They also, because they're using the waste product of that industry, a lot of that waste product is actually the brain. And so when they process the fish oil, they get an oil that is very effective at helping with brain function. And when they also don't concentrate to just EPA and DHA, like practically every other fish oil supplement does. And what that means is, is that their product is more like nature intended and it is a complete full array of healthy fats. And when you look at an analysis of Omega, you see that literally it has dozens of omegas in there. And it happens to have a little bit higher amounts of DHA, which is important for what we're talking about today. This product, Omega, is the one that I've seen studies proving that it is very effective at integrating into cell membranes. And that's really what it's all about here, getting these fats into the membranes of the cells. So that's the fish oil story. Another supplement that's really, really important are probiotics. Probiotics are good bacteria. Again, I would refer you to a webinar that I did just about probiotics. But as it turns out, there's a whole world that lives in our gut. And when that world is disturbed, when there's an imbalance of the bacteria that should be living in our gut, things don't function properly. Why? Well, number one, the gut really is our first brain. We don't think of it that way, but that is our first brain. There's actually more neurotransmitter activity in our gut than there is in our brain. There's also a nerve that's called the vagus nerve that runs directly from the brain right to the enteric system. That's your gut. That's your you know, gastrointestinal. And so there is a direct link between your gut and your brain through this nerve, the vagus nerve. And communication happens because of that. And when there's an imbalance of the good bacteria, that is communicated to the brain and it causes brain dysfunction. Now, it's really funny for us to not think about or make the association between what's going on in our gut and what's going on in our brain, but actually the evidence has always been there for us. We just haven't really looked at it. Think about how many times in the past You've been nervous about something, and where do you feel it? In your gut. And that communication goes the other way as well. When there's a dysfunction in the gut, the brain feels it. What are the different causes of imbalances of the good bacteria in the gut? Well, when I'm doing a talk with people, I usually, um, I usually, yes, uh, Helene uh, just asked a question and asked if, uh, you know, a web address was the one for uh, fish oil, and yes, you got it. And you can get lots of information about that on our website as well because, uh, again, it's one of my favorite products. So when I'm doing a talk, I usually ask for a show of hands, and you can do that where you're sitting right now as well. How many people that are listening right now have taken an antibiotic within the, within the past two weeks? Usually I'll get a few hands raised. And then I say, how many people have had tap water, chicken, or beef in the last two weeks. And, of course, almost everybody raises their hand. Well, almost everybody then has had antibiotics because why do we put chlorine in our tap water to kill bacteria? And it does that in the gut. Other things that beat up the good bacteria in your gut are processed foods and alcohol, caffeine, stress. That's the standard American diet right there. I also wrote appendix there, and the reason is is because – you know, when I was in pharmacy school, we were taught that the appendix was an organ that evolution was making not needed anymore. And to me, that is just the height of medical arrogance. If we don't know what something does, then we just assume it doesn't have a function. Well, the appendix is a reservoir of bacteria to help re-inoculate your gut with good bacteria when there's an imbalance. And my patients who have had their appendix removed have a harder time maintaining their gut bacteria. So again, I want to talk just real quickly about products because there's a whole science in making proper probiotics. And some of them require refrigeration. Some of them don't require refrigeration. Some of them should but don't. 
And so you have to be a little bit weary or really um, educate yourself about this topic because there are companies that make products and maybe they'll say on the label, you know, X amount of bacteria, let's say 10 billion bacteria per capsule. What that means is at time of manufacturer, but, but a manufacturer, but by time that bottle actually makes it from the manufacturer to the wholesaler, to the retailer, to you, oftentimes there's nothing live in there anymore. So when you're looking at a label, you want to make sure that it has a potency that's guaranteed until the time of expiration. The best product that we use, the one that I use most often, I take myself as well, is called Probiotic by a company called Healthy Origins. And the reason I like that is because it's very potent. It's 30 billion bacteria per capsule, guaranteed at time of expiration. It's completely shelf-stable, doesn't have to be refrigerated, which oftentimes is an issue. When we have to refrigerate medicines, we have a tendency to forget to take them because they're not sitting in the counter. And it's a multi-strain formula, and it's the most affordable one that, that we've been able to find as well. And so we sell a bottle of 60 of them for like $20 or something. And uh, one or two of those a day is all you need to help maintain the good bacteria that's in your gut. And as I've been saying, that will affect brain function as well. Okay, supplement number three on the list is vitamin D. Again, I've got a whole webinar that just talks about vitamin D. But here are the important points to understand. Number one, there are vitamin D receptors in your brain. And their purpose seems to be tied to increasing nerve growth. This is why vitamin D is so important when you're pregnant and when you're a baby and for the baby. And that's why vitamin D goes to breast milk the way it does, to help give it to the baby. There are metabolic pathways in the brain, in the hippocampus and the cerebellum. There are metabolic pathways for vitamin D. These are the areas of the brain that are involved in planning, processing of information, and the formation of new memories. That is really important to get, okay? Forms and dosages. Well, vitamin D comes in a synthetic form, which is called vitamin D2, also known as ergocalciferol. And you will see that cheaper vitamins or poorly formulated vitamins like Centrum or One-A-Day actually have synthetic vitamin D in it. Or that prescription vitamin D that is 50,000 units that doctors sometimes coerce their patients into taking once a week is also the synthetic D. And there's natural vitamin D, which is vitamin D3, also called Coley's calciferol. It's slightly, slightly, slightly more expensive, but it's still dirt cheap. And that's the one that you, you want. That's the one that your body makes and uses most efficiently. That's what your body would make if you went out and got exposure, proper exposure to the sun. Um, we do not get enough vitamin D. I'm going to talk about dosages. We do not get a vit enough vitamin D. I really recommend that people get blood tests to know what their vitamin D level is. I will go as far as to say that knowing your vitamin D level may be more important than knowing what your blood sugar is or your cholesterol. And we're all low and the reference range is low. When you look at a blood test from a lab, They'll give you a reference range for vitamin D that in, that's you know somewhere around 30 to 100. That range will differ slightly from different labs, Lab Quest or, Core, or Lab Core or Quest or whatever. And the reason is is because the way that they give those reference ranges is just taking a bell-shaped curve of all the people that they test. But if we're all deficient, then the reference range is going to be low as well, and that's the case. So even though your blood test may say 30 or 32 is a normal blood level or acceptable. It is not. And you want to see your vitamin D level up into the 50 or 60 range. And there are tests, there are studies, research showing that when you have that level up into the 50 or 60 range, you're much less likely to suffer from all sorts of issues, including cancers, um, you know, bone deterioration, osteoporosis, falls, depression, um, uh, cardiovascular disease. Very, very important. We don't get enough of it. Do you know that they do not have a flu season along the equator? And that's because along the equator, they get exposure to vitamin D making sun all year round. Their D levels don't dip in the winter and they don't get sick. And we do here. And that's the reason why. There are a bunch of products out there. First hurdle, make sure that it's vitamin D3. Once you're over that hurdle, price is king. 
and vitamin D3 should be dirt cheap. Now, you will find all sorts of fancy products out there that offer them in different forms, little chewable things or, you know, liquids or this or that, and they just increase the expense without increasing the effectiveness at all. And so vitamin D capsules, 5,000 unit capsules, I think we sell 120 of them for like $7 or something. Very, very inexpensive and the, one of your most useful tools, especially for this topic as well. This is an interesting one that a lot of people don't aren't familiar with, and that's coconut oil. So here's the points. Number one, the brain relies on glucose for energy. That's the main source of energy in the brain, and it can't use other sources of energy like the rest of the body can. And this is so important to the brain that actually brain cells make their own insulin to make sure that they can make use of glucose in the blood. Many of us can become insulin resistant, and that can happen in our brains as well. And so it can literally lead to starvation within the brain. And then functions suffer as well, talking memory, speech, movement, and even personality changes. And of course, carried to its extreme, we can be talking about age-related dementia or Alzheimer's here. The brain can actually begin to atrophy if this happens. Well, here's some interesting news, and that is the brain can use a chemical that's known as ketones for energy as well. Research seems to indicate that ketones can even restore and renew neurons and nerve function after damage has set in. When I hear a statement like that, the first thing I think of is, well, what about people that have had strokes? Coconut oil, well, ketone, and you're about to find out that coconut oil is a source of ketones. Um, may be helpful in helping people recover from stroke, even after damage has happened, even way down the road. Now, you may have heard the term ketone before. A lot of people became familiar with that, with the whole Atkins diet craze, because ketones are produced when fat is converted into energy. And so when you are eating primarily proteins, and getting exercise, your body will start to use some of your stored energy, fat, and the waste product from that process are ketones. And it actually turns out to be fuel for the brain. And it makes perfect sense because if you are not getting any sugar in your diet, if you've cut out carbs in your diet, you're not getting sugar in your blood, your body has to have a mechanism to still feed the brain. And so when you break down fat for energy, ketones are sloughed off and that actually is fuel for the brain. MCT is a term that stands for medium chain triglycerides, and those are a source of ketones, and those come from coconut oil and palm oil. In fact, coconut oil is 66% MCTs. And so as far as a dosage goes, studies have actually shown that a therapeutic dose of MCTs are 20 grams a day. And so that would be a couple tablespoons of coconut oil, or a tablespoon of a more purified product like MCT oil. And that's something that I use a lot with my patients for energy. I use it a lot with athletes because, again, ketones are a source of energy throughout the body. MCT, medium chain triglycerides, are re readily absorbed and then used for energy. Um, and then especially for elderly with focus, concentration, memory, mental decline, cognitive decline, and again, as I talked about, maybe even recovery from something like a stroke. Next supplement I want to talk about is vitamin B12. It's interesting because, let's see, a uh, question from Helene here. I thought having high levels of ketones is bad, and actually it is tested during diabetics related to blood work, and that's right. And You can actually go to the pharmacy. You can get something that are called keto sticks so that you can measure ketones. In diabetes, when carried to its extreme or in unhealthy situations, the body will start to break down muscle. The result of that are ketones, can be ketones, or the body using fat and losing its reserve, the result can be ketones. And so that's where measuring ketones for a diabetic is something that's done that can signal them being in trouble. But when you're getting ketones from a dietary source, there's no downside to that. That's actually a good thing, and it will help with energy. Um, you may have heard 
the craze of, uh, you know, Dr. Oz has been proliferating about raspberry ketones. And um, that's, uh, you know, supposedly going to help with weight loss. It's along the same lines. Unfortunately, it doesn't really help the way Dr. Oz speaks about it. But anyway, so thanks for that question, Helene. I appreciate it. Hopefully that helps you. Okay, so with vitamin B12, what they found is that people with markers of B12 deficiency were more likely to have lower scores on cognitive tests and actually have smaller total brain volume. So mental fogginess and mental issues are two of the first signs of a B12 deficiency. And this is very common with us as we age. And the reason is, is because there's just a very small area within the digestive tract that B12 gets absorbed. And you need a substance that's made in the stomach that's called intrinsic factor for that absorption to happen. And many people don't make intrinsic factor as they age. They actually lose the ability to do it. And so they can't make use of any B12 that comes from their diet or from supplements that they're swallowing either. I ask the question, are blood tests reliable? And they really are not. And that's because you can actually have adequate amounts of B12 in your blood and your body might lack the ability to convert it to the active form and or to get that into tissues where it needs to be used. And so a, B, a B12 blood test saying, oh, your B12 levels are okay does not mean that functionally you have enough B12. So how's the best way to supplement? Well, number one, you want to supplement with the active form, which is called methylcobalamin or methyl B12. The, find the, the, the form that you find common in supplements is called cyanocobalamin. And when you get that into your system, your body has to convert it into methylcobalamin. And some people don't have the ability to do that or do that can, uh, very efficiently. And again, many people can absorb B12 regardless of how they're getting it through their gut. And so what you want to do is use a methyl B12 or methylcobalamin supplement sublingually under your tongue. And that way it gets absorbed right into your bloodstream. A typical dosage would be anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 micrograms every day. And studies have shown that that can be the equivalent of actually getting a B12 injection. And certainly going to be less expensive and you know much more trauma with much less trauma than having to give yourself a shot or having to go to the doctor to get a shot. So a typical dose that I would start with a patient that's aging and showing signs of cognitive decline is probably 3,000 micrograms every morning. And with some of my patients, it's like turning a light switch on. They spark up like you can't believe, and not just with mental things, but with energy as well. Okay, and then there's a whole bunch of specialty nutrients that I just want to mention real fast. And again, I'm trying not to get too scientific here. One of them is called phosphatidylserine, and this is a different fat that is also a component of cell membranes, especially nerves and uh, nerve cells and brain cells. There's a, there's a nutrient, it's an amino acid, which is called carnitine. And basically what it does is it helps increase energy within every cell of your body. It's sort of like the forklift that carries sugar, glucose, from the cell membrane to the mitochondria to convert it into energy, ATP. Um, and so it's sort of like the, the forklift that does that. And so when you have more carnitine, you have the ability to use sugar more efficiently and make more energy. Well, the form that you see in front of you, acetyl L-carnitine is the form that crosses the blood-brain barrier. So that helps with that process literally with your brain cells. You've heard of ginkgo biloba. Maybe you've not heard of another nutrient called vinpocetine. Both of those are known to increase the microcirculation within your body, including your brain, so that oxygen and nutrition can be delivered more efficiently. There's an herb called bacopa. That is an Ayurvedic herb from the country of India. And, and that is used traditionally to promote memory, mental function, and information processing. And there's a nutrient called huperzine A. And what that does is increases acetylcholine levels, and that is a, an important brain chemical. And that will enhance communication from cell to cell. And there's actually been some study using huperzine A in, um, uh, in certain, you know, degenerative, nerve degenerative uh, diseases like Parkinson's. So, uh, and now's a good time to type in any questions that I haven't, that you still have that I haven't covered on the topic because we're going to be uh, closing down in a few minutes. All of these supplements you could take individually. It gets really expensive. You have to have the proper dosages. So I look for combinations of products that are formulated appropriately 
and have proper amounts of them. And you, what you want to look for is something that doesn't necessarily say, mm, you know, a, a blend of all of these things because you want to know that they have all of the right amounts in them. So there is a product that I use made by a company called Zymogen. That's Zymogen with an X. And the product is called Memorol. And it has a combination of all of these nutrients plus a couple others in the appropriate dosages to make them work properly. So get a question here from Lori. What would the dose of Bacopa be? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly if I remember correctly. It's probably in the two to 300 milligram range if that's what you're using by itself, sometimes up to 500 milligrams. When used in combination like in a formula like this, I think 50 to 100 milligrams is all you need. Thanks for that question, Lori. Appreciate it. Um, Lahan is asking, what's the recommended supplement that includes all supplements? Please repeat the name. So they're, oh, oh, it's called Memorall, M-E-M-O-R-A-L-L by a company called Zymogen. And I've seen a lot of memory formulas out there. They have the right things in them, but not the appropriate amounts. Of them. So you need 100 milligrams of phosphatidylserine. You need 500 milligrams of acetyl L-carnitine. And sometimes you'll see products that put the, um, you know, the, the right nutrients in there, but not the right amounts because they're expensive or because it's just window dressing or whatever. So it's called Memorol. Thanks for that question. Can you recap on the essential fatty acids? What would be good to purchase? I'm not typing fast enough to, sorry about that. Um, so the product is called Whole Mega, W-H-O-L-E, Mega, by New Chapter. Four capsules a day, two with breakfast and two with dinner. It's the best product out there. It's the best fish oil. And as I said, it's the most, you know, fish oil is the most studied supplement out there. This company, New Chapter, does studies or has independent people do studies on their, their products. And, you know, the results that we see from the Whole Mega are just amazing clinically. It lowers inflammation. You'll love what it does for your skin, your hair, your nails. It's the healthiest thing you can do for your heart. It helps normalize cholesterol, raise the good cholesterol, make more big, fat, fluffy molecules, um, lower the bad cholesterol, uh, helps lubricate the joint. And for what we're talking about today, focus, concentration, and memory really improve from that. So uh, you are very welcome, Nancy. And one more question from Susan. This says, how do we maintain hormonal balance other than avoiding or learning to deal with stress? Good question. So um, some, there are some genetic components to that. Um, and so you might have a tendency towards one versus the other. Generally, we can have estrogen dominance, which means that we have too much estrogen. That can happen from the environment. We can get estrogen-like compounds that are called xenoestrogens with an X, X-E-N-O estrogens. And when they get into our body, they act like estrogens. Our body thinks it's an estrogen, but they do not go away like estrogens do or are supposed to with the ones that your body makes. And these come from color, colorings and preservatives and flavorings and pesticides and plastics. And so eating a processed food diet, eating foods that come out of packages that have numbers in, in them and names that you can't pronounce, those are estrogen-like compounds. And those really contribute to uh, to hormonal imbalances. And then the other side of the coin is, coin is low levels of progesterone, and that happens from stress more than anything else. And so uh, there are um, herbs that we use that calm or mitigate the uh, effect of stress and um, will help calm that tendency down. Exercise plays a very important role with uh, hormonal balance. Uh, the imbalance of good bacteria in your gut affects hormonal balance as well. And so it's really, um, you know, there's no one answer for that. It's a complicated thing. And uh, for you, Susan, or anyone else out there, if you want to talk about that more in particular with you as an individual, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me, and I'm happy to sort of go over that with you. Lori has a question here. Can you take both the whole mega and the Memorol together? Yes. And in fact, that is a regimen that I often get my elderly patients on who are complaining about losing memory and focus and concentration, and they do excellent. And lots of times I will add to that a sublingual B12, and that makes a really nice sort of cocktail that um, that affects memory and focus and concentration as well as many other things. So, um, wow, thanks for all those questions. Thanks for your participation. I really do appreciate it. Just want to point out again that on our website, all of our webinars get recorded, and they're there for you to watch again or to refer to someone else, and there's all sorts of other topics on there, including what you see in front of you, stress and weight loss and sleep and cholesterol, osteoporosis and... 
depression and anxiety and all sorts of other issues as well. I do appreciate your attendance. I really honor your willingness to spend some of your valuable time with me. I hope you have found it worth it. And I look forward to seeing you uh, again on this venue sometime soon. Everybody have a great afternoon.